Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second part of our presentation, Modern ECU Development. And my colleague Michael already gave you some insights of the tooling and the tooling workflow in the first presentation. And in this presentation, I would like to focus on the uh, basic software running directly in the ECU. My name is Markus Oertel and I'm working in the product management for embedded software. Before we start, I would like to define quickly what I mean with modern in this case. And by doing this, I would like to go back to the past, more precisely to the evolution of vehicle architectures. And a couple of years ago, uh, these architectures were very hardware oriented. So in these so-called distributed architectures, um, basically every function was represented by an own box developed by an own uh, manufacturer. And um, if this ECU um, needs sensors and actuators, typically they were developed in this project and data from the network um, has to be um, routed to this um, ECU by adapting the communication metrics and the gateways. So here we're coming directly to the drawbacks of this approach. It's super difficult to add new functions to the vehicle and to modify them later on. And there was basically no reuse because you cannot transfer this ECU to another vehicle. So based from these drawbacks, um, the second type of architecture, the so-called domain architectures, have been developed. And here you see um, these uh, fancy blue um, big ECUs. And um, in, on these domain ECUs, um, it has been tried to put all the software together for one speci uh, specific domain, therefore the name. And um, on these ECUs, it was the first time that software from multiple suppliers has been combined, and these are sharing the same set of sensors and actuators. Um, this is already a great step into the right direction um, because you have reuse and you can um, use much more of the shelf components. But the only drawback you have with this approach is that nowadays uh, domains really um, are merged together. Let's imagine a um, parking assist. Such a parking assist um, needs the brakes, needs the steering, needs the cameras, needs the infotainment system. So um, basically you're using functions from all domains. And in order to um, get around this problem, um, the third type of architectures has been developed, the so-called central architectures. The idea is to just have smart sensors um, in the vehicle here, like um, uh, uh, either directly connected or over so-called I.O. nodes. And uh, one or two or three uh, bigger um, central computing units in the middle of the vehicle um, encompass all the software and um, uh, it's uh, calculated there. So with this approach, um, you have the maximum of um, uh, software reuse because you can just transfer the software from one vehicle line to another. And um, you can even keep um, easily um, uh, the already existing issues in the field up to date because they're much less hardware dependent. So right now, um, we are somewhere in the transition from, from two to three. Um, and the question is, how do you build such an ECU that leverages all of these um, benefits mentioned here? And this is exactly what this presentation is about. I would like to show you how. Let's start with the general architecture of these ECUs. So here you see that there are two different parts um, inside of these um, ECUs, a microcontroller side and a microprocessor side. And you always need both because they have inherently different properties. Let's start with the microcontroller. Here, um, because these are typically less powerful, but they have um, a much better real-time performance, meaning they have a much smaller jitter and can react faster to inputs and outputs. Um, on the other side, these types of controllers are typically better to verify and therefore have a higher ACL rating, meaning it's much easier to put um, safety-related software on there. On the other side, on the microprocessor, we have um, other properties. These are much more PC-like, and this has the benefit that you can install multiple operating systems, such as Linux, QNX, Integrity, VXWorks, um, Android. And um, of course, you have the benefit of installing software dynamically as you know it from mobile devices or your PC. And the backend connectivity is also easier to establish here. And also, the use cases um, for these types, for the software on, on these types of parts of controllers um, differ according to these properties. So on the microcontroller side, we are typically talking about um, 
direct I.O. interaction or we're connecting sensors which have a very fast control loop such as the um, ABS system or, or compressors. On the other side, on the microprocessor, we typically connect sensors and actuators that produce a lot of data to use the um, high computational power of these types of chips. So such as radar system, cameras um, or leader systems. And um, the bus systems which are connected also are a little bit reflected here. So on the microcontroller side, you have the classical bus systems like CAN, LIN and FlexRay. And on the microprocessor side, we're mainly using Ethernet. And what is also important is the IPC connection, the interprocessor communication here. And it depends if you put both of these systems on the same chip, on a SOC design, or if you have really two different controllers um, on, on your board, um, this IPC is using a different technology, maybe shared memory, maybe PCI Express, maybe SPI. But this communication link needs to be fast and reliable. So let's have a look now at the software architecture. Here on the microcontroller side, we have a uh, MPU-based um, uh, system where a bare metal OS like a classic Autosar is running, where the software components are put together in one binary um, with the operating system and put in one piece um, to the controller. It's looking slightly more complex on the microprocessor side. Here we see that hypervisors are, um, now, are nowadays a standard part of the um, vehicle architectures or the ECU architectures uh, for two different reasons, either for run multiple operating systems in parallel, like here indicated the POSIX OS together with an Android system, or you can run multiple operating systems just um, to separate concerns um, such as safety or security. The application parts here are um, individual um, binaries so they can install it um, separately from each other and this directly puts a requirement on the communication. If you install something new you also need to dynamically create new communication path and this is typically done here using a service oriented architecture so um, that services can be found dynamically while there are um, uh, while new software is installed in the vehicle or Another approach is using shared memory and a companion library. There, there are multiple ways um, of achieving this. On the um, classic um, controller side or the classic autosar side, um, typically the peripherals are really hardwired to the specific software components and uh, this area is um, not that dynamic. Okay, and of course it's really important to also have a software, uh, a nice mechanism to use the IPC um, between these two um, types of uh, controllers and uh, with our VIPC technology we provide an easy solution to communicate from classic to autosar or vice versa. And although this architecture on, on these figures um, is actually pretty looking simple on the first glance, it has a couple of pitfalls um, where I would like uh, to have a look at now. So let's start um, with security. And again, here the picture on the right looks pretty similar to the picture on the left. Um, but on the microcontrollers, security is working totally different than on the microprocessors. Let's start on the right side. Here we see that um, the microcontroller has a dedicated part of the chip where uh, security-related uh, software should be placed, um, a so-called HSM. And this HSM is running an own operating system, for example, our Microsoft VHSM, which is a specific um, operating system for um, the security purposes. And the application software components can use over the RTE and our crypto stack this um, HSM. So the software components do not really see um, that there is um, a switch in the controllers. This is done automatically by our software. On the microprocessor side, it's in that case different that there is not a dedicated part of the chip um, which is used for this um, the security software, um, but you can switch the mode of the full chip to a security mode. And this is typically called trust zone. And um, to access this trust zone mode, um, there is um, normally a library from the semiconductor, like a, a cryptographic library, uh, which we are integrating in our cryptographic daemon and is then used um, by the application. And again, here the application um, doesn't need to know that there are 
vendor specific um, solutions and um, different um, trust zone operating systems, uh, the application is just uh, implemented against one unified framework here. So actually, um, the cryptographic algorithms are just a very, very small part of uh, the security domain. If you would like to know something more about um, secure boot or key handling, um, please visit us at our virtual booth. Let's now go um, to a second very important aspect in these types of controllers, safety. Here you see on the right side again um, the um, classic Autosar uh, system running on a microcontroller. And I already told you that these types of controllers are um, easier to verify and they have also a uh, much better fit rate. This means these types of chips are more reliable. Therefore, it's really no wonder that um, it's been tried to put more safety-related software on the microcontroller side. And um, don't get me wrong here, it doesn't mean that the processor side is not um, intended for safety um, applications. In fact, we are currently finishing our um, certification for our adaptive microSAS stack um, for ASLD. But um, there are two different types of safety requirements. Um, to understand this, let's, let's look at a little example. Let's look at an automated highway pilot. So in these types of software, there are um, parts in there which need to work no matter what, because you need um, to bridge some time um, to um, that the system is continue working until the driver can take over. These parts of the software which need to work, um, they have so-called availability requirements because they need to be there. And um, in terms of the overall safety concept, we would call these parts of the system fail operational parts. And this is indicated here in red. And um, there are th these types are typically allocated on the microcontroller side. Still, it's not easy also on the, um, on the microprocessor side. Um, it, it seems like it is, but it's not. Let's, let's just have a simple example here. Let's look at the operating system. So um, the operating system and, and the blue parts here, which, which are um, uh, named a fail safe, um, uh, which means that um, it's sufficient to detect a problem and, and switch off. So they don't have these availability requirements. But um, the operating system needs to, for example, ensure that the memory management um, is uh, working correctly. And because of this, um, operating systems with a microkernel architecture are currently in favor because all of the different parts of the operating system are put in separated modules. If you have a monolithic kernel, um, such as Linux, it's very difficult um, to give evidence that the memory management part of your kernel is safe, but you haven't really looked at the other parts because they are not separated in this um, uh, monolithic structure. So therefore you see um, also um, problems on uh, this side occur. Um, but don't worry, uh, our software um, is for uh, the controller side already available as a uh, fail operational uh, version and um, even for the adaptive Autosar software we are currently creating a roadmap how to get uh, availability requirements into that piece of software. Okay, let's now come to one of the killer features of these modern ECUs, the over-the-air update. So here we need to create a little bit more space because we need more components. And um, one of these is of course the backend. In this um, backend or from this backend, a so-called OTA client can download the um, software packages which are um, prepared before onto the vehicle and is then uh, distributing these packages um, to the different microcontrollers and microprocessors. Again, package handling is working differently here. So on the classic auto source side, we see that we have a um, so-called OTA handler, which is the uh, counterpart for the OTA client and passing on the package to the so-called software update manager, like cryptic name here. Um, but this software update manager is doing the actual magic. What it can do, it can flash the controller in the background while it's running in normal operation. And while you think now, hmm, that sounds a little bit risky, why should I do that? There are good arguments why you should do this. Um, imagine you would do it in the post-run phase. 
These types of controllers, especially with the processors, require lots of power. This means that um, when you park the vehicle and you would like to start your updates, you constantly need to check what your battery status is. Maybe you cannot even start the update at all. You also need to check what other ECUs are required um, and you need to have proper shutdown sequences and so on. So your state management and your power management is becoming terribly complicated. If you're using this kind of approach, um, simply at the, uh, if the uh, download is finished, the next reboot is booting into the newly installed system. So you don't need to do anything in the post run phase. On the adaptive order side, it's even more advanced. So here we are um, downloading the package over so-called so DSA, a diagnostic service application, passing it to the UCM, the update and configuration manager. And here we can update the applications in place, meaning we can um, install an application and make it run and available to the system um, without the reboot, such as you know this from your Android or iOS cell phones. And what is more important here is um, that the uh, updates you're doing on both sides, because you have split up functions on the left and on the right, is done um, in a consistent manner. And our offboard tooling is helping you here to create um, an update campaign which contains packages for both sides, and our onboard software guarantees that uh, if one side um, fails with the update, a rollback is performed also on the other side. So you can sleep much better while your fleet is performing an update. So let's come to the conclusion. And um, I have presented you in um, the cu last couple of minutes that there are um, these two types of um, controllers and processors in, in this ECU with their different uh, benefits and their different challenges. Luckily, we have a good um, partnership here from Classic and Adaptive Autosar, um, which is providing you a, a framework so that you can easily split up your functions to benefit from both of these worlds. So with our tooling, you can easily split up the functions, you can create your cross-system communication, and of course, we help you with the um, major points for safety, security, and consistent updates. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward now to your questions. And if you like, you can visit us later on also in our virtual booth.